On July 11, 1983, the body of 41-year-old Linda Lawson was found at the end of Memorial Highway in Tampa, Florida. Investigators said that she had been assaulted, shot in the head, and then dumped in the bushes. Linda was a freelance photographer who grew up in New York and had moved to Tampa as an adult. About a month later, on August 19, 1983, the body of 19-year-old Barbara Graham was found behind a dentist's office in the Tampa Heights area. She had also been assaulted before her life was taken. Barbara was described as a friendly outgoing teenager from Tampa who had a job at the mall and liked to walk to stay fit. A man by the name of Robert Dubois soon became a suspect in Barbara's case. He was convicted because a bite mark analysis said that Robert was responsible for a bite mark on Barbara's face. Dubois denied any involvement and contacted the Innocence Project. In 2020, with the help of advancements in DNA and the Conviction Review Unit, Dubois was exonerated after spending 37 years in jail for a crime he did not commit. The Conviction Review Unit then went on to do more DNA testing to see who was responsible for taking the life of Barbara Graham. After further DNA testing, they realized that not one man was responsible, but two. They also determined that these two were responsible for many crimes in the Tampa area in 1983. The two men are 58-year-old Amos Robinson and 57-year-old Abraham Scott. They took the lives of both Barbara Graham and Linda Lonson. They are already serving life sentences, but investigators want to make sure that their crimes against Barbara and Linda do not go unpunished. Investigators are working hard to find other crimes that Robinson and Scott are responsible for. Linda Sheffield, who was Linda Lonson's niece, close friend, and roommate had this to say, when it happened, it was shock and disbelief, whereas now it's more retrospective. This is a day I never thought would come. So to have somebody accountable for what they did, not only to my aunt, but to everyone else and every other family they touched is beyond anything I would have expected. It means everything to me. State Attorney Andrew Warren, who announced the two indictments in August 2022, said, When we created the Conviction Review Unit, it was the first in Tampa Bay and one of the first in Florida. The CRU reviews plausible claims of innocence. It's there to safeguard against wrongful convictions. As we see today, in the rare case when the wrong person is convicted, the actual criminals get away with the crime. But for those victims, that stops now. This shows the power of a conviction review unit to right wrongs, uncover the truth, and deliver justice for victims even after almost 40 years. What do you think? Let me know in comments. Also, if you like this content, subscribe please. We are very close to 1,000 family. Let's continue the video. 23-year-old Shannon Lloyd lived in Orange County, California in 1986. She was a tomboy who loved horses and had an adventurous soul. On May 21st, Shannon's body was found inside her bedroom in Garden Grove. She had been assaulted and strangled. Shannon's older brother, Tom Lloyd, had this to say at the time, It's hard for me to fathom how anyone could take another person's life, like it was nothing, and just discard them. Investigators collected male DNA belonging to the suspect from the crime scene. In 2003, authorities linked what happened to Shannon to the cold case of Renee Cavas. 27-year-old Renee's body was found on a road near El Toro Marine Base in Irvine, California in 1989. When investigators entered the suspect's DNA profile in Shannon's case into the combined DNA index system, they noticed that the same man was responsible for taking the lives of both Shannon and Renee. Unfortunately, his identity could not be determined. In 2021, the Orange County District Attorney's investigative genetic genealogy team identified a Las Vegas man named Reuben J. Smith as a possible suspect. Smith lived in Orange County in the 1980s. He was forced to give his DNA in 1998 after being arrested in Las Vegas for assault and attempting to take the life of a woman. In July of 2022, it was confirmed that the DNA evidence from his arrest matched the DNA found at the crime scene of both Shannon and Renee. Orange County District Attorney Todd Spitzer said, Because of the advent of science, there's no case that's cold anymore. Every case is potentially solvable. Justice does not have an expiration date. Whether a crime happened 40 years ago or 4 minutes ago, the residents of Orange County can have confidence that law enforcement in this county will not rest until justice is served. The loved ones of Renee Cavas and Shannon Lloyd have the answers to questions they've been asking for more than three decades. 
The third unknown victim of his that survived said the evil in him. I know if I didn't fight, I was going to die. It was horrible. The things that he did, the things that he said. Though she was able to fight him off and escape, she said she is still haunted by him. One year after being arrested in 1998, Smith took his own life at 39 years old. This is infuriating as the victim's families themselves said that all their questions can't be answered. They know who and where, but not why. Detectives are now looking into the possibility that Smith could be implicated in other cases. 18-year-old Barbara Jean Jepson and her husband, Joe Jepson, lived in Van Nuys, California in January 1956. The couple got married the previous year and Barbara was four months pregnant. Joe worked for the National Air Guard. On January 31, 1956, Joe went to work early in the morning and Barbara was last seen shopping at 12.30 p.m. When Joe returned home, he found Barbara's body in their bed. She had been fatally stabbed. After the gruesome discovery, Joe first covered up his wife with a blanket and then called the police. Detectives who responded to the Jepson house that day found several items of evidence, such as a green army jacket with blood and hair follicles in a garage. One witness told police that a person was seen leaving the area that day wearing a green jacket. Another talked about seeing a man with big hands and big knuckles. Unfortunately, investigators back then didn't know how great DNA would eventually be at solving cold cases. So items such as the pillowcases, bedsheets, and a bloody rag found in the sink at the Jepson home were not collected. At the time, detectives believed that what happened to Barbara was linked to a series of assaults in the same area. They tracked down every man who had committed similar crimes in the area and questioned them. Unfortunately, this did not lead anywhere and the case went cold. In 2019, Los Angeles Police Detective Rachel Evans took another look at Barbara's case. It was the very first case she was assigned to after joining the cold case unit. On her first day, a veteran detective handed her the case file and said good luck. By the time she started working on it, hundreds of detectives already combed through it over the past 60 years. It took Evans a week to read through the entire case file. Then she read it a second time and started taking notes. The third time she read through the file, she started noticing a lot of things. One of the things she picked up on was that there was no forced entry at the Jepsons' home. It seemed to Evans that Barbara knew the person who attacked her. She also noticed that no valuables were taken and nothing was out of place. As Evans reviewed the case, it wasn't long before she started focusing on one man. A man from Utah by the name of Mont Mers. Mers was born on May 24, 1911 in Mount Pleasant, Utah. In 1931, he married Cleo Reem and the couple had one son and one daughter. They were later divorced and Mers married another woman, Bernice, in the San Fernando Valley. That marriage also ended in divorce in 1945, with Bernice citing cruelty. By then, Mers was an avid gambler, violent towards animals, a womanizer, and a raging alcoholic. He was also the suspect in many assault cases. By 1948, he moved in with a woman named Fern Spive in the San Fernando Valley and stayed with her for six years. At the time Mers and Spiva began living together, she had a 10-year-old daughter from a previous relationship. That daughter is Barbara. Evans believed that Murray's abused her along the way because that was kind of his modus operandi. He would marry young women who had young girls and he would then go on to abuse them. In 1955, when Barbara married Joe, Mers married his fourth wife. This woman also had a young daughter. In 1960, 15-year-old Mary and Pedrada, who had a horse stable next to Mers and often rode horses with him, was found fatally stabbed. Then in 1962, Mers married his fifth wife, Ina. She too had a young daughter. In 1964, Mont Mers was arrested and accused of abusing a 14-year-old girl. Information on that case was hard for Evans to collect because the case file had been destroyed. Although it is clear that Mers was involved in many crimes, this was the only victim for which he was arrested. Also, in 1964, while waiting for the trial, Mers showed up at a hospital with a gunshot wound. He claimed that it was an accidental shooting. Who shot Mers and why was never determined. By 1965, all of Mers' crimes were coming to a head. He was given a polygraph test by police who asked him about what happened to Barbara Jefferson. He denied even knowing her. 
Investigators knew that he was at her funeral and that he knew her since she was 10 because he was married to her mom for some time. The polygraph test results concluded that Mers had definite guilty knowledge regarding the fate of Barbara. On August 15, 1965, while Mers was out of jail and with numerous questions looming about what else he had been involved with, his wife, Anna, found underwear from a young girl in a drawer in their house. She confronted Mers about whether he had also been abusing the girl. The confrontation was apparently the last straw as Mers proceeded to grab a gun from inside the house. He chased Ina into the street where he fatally shot her. He then went back inside the house and took his own life. Recently, a former stepdaughter of Murray's called the police to tell them about 15-year-old Mary and Pedrada, the girl who often rode horses with Murs and who was stabbed nine times. The stepdaughter told police that she was 10 years old at the time and she remembers that on the day that Mary and lost her life, Maurice came into the house with a bloody knife and blood on his hands and clothing. The stepdaughter waited until he and his entire family were no longer alive until she told the police. That's how scared she was. She told the police that she still had nightmares of him every night. Evans would soon learn that Mers had a pattern of never leaving his victims alone even after he remarried or when his stepdaughters grew up and moved out of the house. According to Evans' research, five women were seen at Mers' funeral wearing black and crying. Kevin said, so he was kind of a womanizer. He had all these women that he connected with and kind of kept. There's a lot of stories around him with these young girls that were abused by him. Until the day Barbara's mom passed away, even though they were no longer married, Mers would still visit her. That's why Evans believes on the day that Barbara's life was taken, Mers showed up at her residence and did not need to break into her house. As you'll remember, one of the witnesses saw a man wearing a green jacket with big hands and big knuckles. Big hands and big knuckles were something the Mers family were known for. The drawing of the person who was believed to have committed the assaults in the area showed a man who wore a plaid shirt. Evans said that Mers was also known to always wear a plaid shirt. He was wearing one in his mugshot taken in his 1964 arrest. Most of his victims had their hands bound during their attacks. The same was the case with Barbara. Despite the lack of DNA evidence that still exists today from the crime scene, Evans attempted to use today's DNA technology to help solve the case. After some extensive research, Evans was able to track down Murr's relatives still living in Utah in 2019, including his children. Evans gives big kudos to Draper Police and Unified Police for assisting her investigation. In September 2019, a search warrant for DNA was served to Murr's 87-year-old son. Murr's son passed away just two weeks after the DNA was collected. Unfortunately, it was ultimately determined there was not enough DNA from the crime scene compared with the DNA collected from Mer's son. Evans said now that police have it preserved, they will revisit the case about every five years to see if advances in DNA technology get to the point so that the old DNA can finally be tested and compared to familial DNA from Mer's. Even though the DNA from the crime scene is too weak to prove 100% it was Murs, investigators believe now in 2022 they have more than enough evidence against Murs that if he were still alive, he would be found guilty of taking Barbara's life. Investigators have also been able to clear other suspects using the DNA. One of these people was Barbara's husband, Joe. Even though he was cleared by the police in the initial investigation, he lived the rest of his life with a stigma surrounding him. Some members of the community questioned his innocence since he was the one who found his wife's body. Joe remarried and had two sons. Although the boys always believed their father was innocent, Evans said it was especially satisfying to be able to call them earlier this year and tell them that their father had conclusively been cleared. On the other side, Evans said Murr's grandchildren were upset when she told them what kind of person their grandfather really was. They had been told that he had passed away in a car accident. The grandchildren took the pictures they had of him out of their homes and threw them away. To solve Barbara's case, Evans said she took a page from the detectives of the 1950s, pounding the pavement and turning over rocks looking for clues. But Evans also has her own gift for striking up conversations with people. People have a lot of info to share, so you sit back and listen to them, she said. In addition to having to prove herself to the veteran detectives, Evans admits she felt solving the case was something she had to do for Barbara Jefferson's family so that they could finally have some peace about what happened. 
She admits that at times she felt guided as she worked to solve the six decades old cold case. I think people are crying from the dust for justice. Their families need it. I know it's not my family, but there's somebody who's still crying over this. You had a husband that passed away that people always had suspicion about. So for me, you get closure for the families to know that their dad was good or their mom was great. You know you have some peace for them because they lived all these years with no peace. So for me and others I work with, we do this so the families can have rest. I can't bring them back, but the families can have rest. What do you think? Let me know in comment. 25-year-old Navy major lived with her husband, Mark, and their infant son, Dan, in an apartment in Willoughby, Ohio in 1980. When Mark returned home from work on January 11, 1980, he found Nadine's body in their dining room. She had been stabbed more than 40 times. Just a few feet from the body was their son still in his living room playpen. Fortunately, he was unharmed. During the initial investigation, Willoughby police determined that Nadine's life was taken sometime between 1.15 p.m. and 4.45 p.m. There were no signs of forced entry nor evidence that she had been assaulted. Nothing seemed to be missing from the home except the weapon, which came from Nadine's kitchen. The person who took her life did, however, leave something behind. His blood was found on Nadine's shirt. A significant amount of blood belonging to an unknown male was located on Nadine's shirt, said police. Some of the suspect's blood on Nadine's shirt was in the form of perpendicular drops, indicating that the suspect was standing on top of Nadine while he was bleeding. A neighbor of Nadine noticed a canary yellow Dodge Dart parked in the rear of their apartment complex around the time her life was taken. It's not a car that belonged to anyone living in the complex. Investigators followed up on the lead, but unfortunately it did not lead anywhere and the case went cold. In 2015, police received new information based on the DNA found on Nadine's clothing after establishing a partnership with the Lake County Crim Lab, the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigations, and the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit. They later teamed up with the Lake County Prosecutor's Office and Parabon Nanolap to build a family tree from the DNA profile, ultimately leading them to Stephen Joseph Esim Kak through the use of genetic genealogy. Investigators compared the male DNA from blood on Nadine's shirt to one of Simcac's biological children and found a match. People who knew Esim Kak then confirmed he had owned a canary yellow Dodge Dart back in 1980. Authorities then looked into Simcac's work record from his 37-year career at Lincoln Electric Company in Euclid, Ohio, which is less than 10 miles from Willoughby. In 1980, Esim Kak only missed one day of work, the day Nadine's life was taken. Esim Kak was due in for a second shift that day and called in sick. Police also learned that at the time Esim Kak had other jobs delivering flowers for Wycliffe, Laurel and working with Beat Antonio's winery in Wycliffe, just a few miles southwest of both his and Nadine's home. Simcac retired in 2002 and moved to Bemis Point, New York, about 60 miles southwest of Buffalo, according to police. He passed away at 79 in 2018, leaving behind a wife, three biological children, and two stepchildren. Nadine's husband, Mark Major, had this to say at a press conference held by police. He stole Nadine from her family and friends. Most of all, he stole Nadine from me and my son. How could he get up every day and look himself in the mirror knowing what he did? She did not deserve this. He continued, if there's a place in hell, I know he's in it and I hope he rots there. Mark continued that Nadine did not know Esim Kak, leaving loved ones and investigators puzzled about a possible motive. Nadine's son Dan had this to say at the press conference. I am angry that Stephen passed away as a free and carefree citizen before he could be identified as well as caught, and in turn, given the ability for questions to be asked and justice to be served. 76-year-old Helen Vogt lived in Erie, Pennsylvania in July 1988. She was recently widowed as her husband Herbert passed away four months earlier in February. Erie police were called to Helen's townhouse at 7.18 a.m. on July 23, 1988. A witness grew alarmed after seeing Helen's 1988 Buick LaSabre back out of her garage at a high rate of speed, with the driver of the car wearing a towel wrapped around his head. The witness went to check on Helen and found her body and then called the police. Helen was stabbed with two kitchen knives and a two-pronged fork. 
An autopsy determined that she had suffered more than 50 stab wounds to her hands, face, neck, chest, and back. A witness who lived next door told police that she heard muffled sounds consistent with screaming coming from Helen's townhouse at about 10.30 p.m. the previous evening. The witness also said she heard noises of furniture moving as well as people going up and down the stairs. Investigators described the house as ransacked. Dresser drawers were pulled open and items were thrown about the townhouse. Helen was known to keep money, bonds, and personal paperwork in a briefcase at her home. But when detectives opened it, the briefcase was empty. Other items missing included credit cards, a white purse, a watch, and Helen's diamond ring that she never took off. Detectives found no sign of forced entry. They did, however, find blood on a washcloth in Helen's shower. There was also blood taken from Helen's kitchen sink. It did not belong to her, so police theorized that the suspect accidentally cut himself during the attack. On August 1, 1988, about a month after Helen's life was taken, her car was found in Dayton, Ohio. It was located in a parking garage next to a Greyhound bus station. Investigators also found that three days before Helen lost her life, she met with her lawyers and changed her will. She left half her estate to her daughter, Bonnie. The other half was to be split between her two grandchildren, Bethany and Jeremy. Investigators got a search warrant to obtain samples of blood, saliva, hair, and a complete handprint from Helen's family members to be compared to the blood found at the crime scene. It was submitted to the Pennsylvania State Police Crime Lab in 1990, but results were inconclusive as DNA was not advanced enough. In 2022, the DNA was again entered into the crime lab. This time, it confirmed that Helen's grandson, Jeremy Brock, was responsible. He was 21 years old back in 1988. In July of 2022, 55-year-old Jeremy C. Brock was arrested at his home in Austin, Texas. He is currently at Travis County Jail in Austin and will be taken to Erie County, Pennsylvania, soon. Erie Police Chief Dan Pizzarni said at the news conference, with the advancement of forensic technology, the Pennsylvania State Police Crime Lab in Greensboro, Pennsylvania, was able to reanalyze the previously submitted evidence. What do you think? Let me know in comments. 21-year-old Heather and Williams lived in an apartment in Leon Valley, Texas, in 2005. On February 22nd, Heather's friends became concerned when they could not reach her. The friends entered her apartment through a sliding glass door and everyone's worst fears were realized as they found Heather's body in her bedroom. Heather's hands had been severed and her clothes were burned in an apparent effort to conceal evidence. It was also determined that she had been assaulted. Neighbors of Heather told police they heard her arguing with a man the previous day, describing shuffling sounds and then silence at 5 a.m. in the morning. Investigators questioned many people close to Heather, and one of those individuals was Jose Baldwin Flores, who went to high school with her and stayed in touch afterwards. Flores, one of the last to see her alive, denied any involvement, and the DNA collected from Heather's body that belonged to the suspect was not strong enough to match to anyone. Six years later, in 2011, 30-year-old Esmeralda's life was taken in a similar fashion to Heather's. She lived in San Antonio, Texas, and her body was found tied to her bed on March 2nd. She had been bludgeoned and strangled, and another fire had been set in an attempt to conceal evidence. A month after Esmeralda's life was taken, Jose Flores was arrested in connection with her case. The charges against him were dropped a month later, and a request to further investigate the case was denied. In 2015, then-District Attorney Nico Lee Hutt decided to take another look. Then, in December 2016, Flores was again arrested, this time charged with taking the lives of Heather and Esmeralda. DNA linked him to both cases. According to San Antonio officials, the pandemic slowed down the pace of court proceedings considerably. In early 2022, District Judge Melissa Skinner decided that all sides had waited long enough. However, on the eve of jury selection for the trial, Flores took responsibility. The 41-year-old Flores was then sentenced to three separate life sentences. Heather's mother, Donna Ellis, had this to say during a victim impact statement read during the sentencing, every fiber of my being wants you to suffer and live in fear just as my Heather did, just as Esmeralda did. Today, I take back my life. I forgive you. Esmeralda's family had a victim advocate read a letter to Flores expressing a wish for him to experience pain and suffering.
30-year-old Patricia Stickler lived in Sylvania, Ohio with her three daughters in 1985. She was divorced and worked for more than seven years with the 21st Century Health Spas. Patricia's body was discovered by her 11-year-old daughter in the early morning hours of January 2, 1985. Someone had entered their home and slashed her throat while she slept. Patricia's three daughters were sleeping in their beds down the hall when the crime occurred. A window in the home had been left open, though it was unclear whether it was opened by Patricia or someone else. Investigators stated that there were no signs of forced entry. Fortunately, there was a DNA sample from the crime scene that belonged to an unknown male. In 1985, authorities were unable to identify a suspect despite a thorough investigation. Two new detectives were assigned to the case in 1998, but once again it remained unsolved, even with the help of the Ohio Bureau of Investigation. Recently, the DNA profile became the focus of the investigation. Authorities enlisted the help of multiple agencies, including the Ohio BCI Forensic Lab and Lucas County Prosecutor's Office. They also established a new partnership with Advanced DNA Forensic Genealogy. Using genetic genealogy, experts determined the DNA belonged to Michael Malaz, whom investigators later determined was less than a hundred feet from Patricia's home on the night her life was taken. He was 17 years old at the time and in high school, living on the same street as Patricia, just six houses away. Authorities stated that Malaz was not acquainted with Patricia or her family and would not have had any reason to be inside the victim's home. Malaz passed away before he could face prosecution, having joined the U.S. Army after graduating high school and losing his life in a single-vehicle car accident in 1989 while stationed in North Carolina. For Patricia's surviving daughters, who vowed to see their mother's case solved, questions remained. How did he get into their home? Did he see them? Why didn't he take their lives? Kristen Kelly, one of the daughters, said, help us understand the unknowns. Help her children in their suffering because it's not fair to any of us. What do you think? Let me know in comments.